Hey everybody, this is Deb with Truthfication Chronicles, and today I spent the day watching the hearing on sanctuary jurisdictions, the impact on public safety and victims. And this is with the Senate Committee on the Judiciary. Now, typically, Lindsey Graham is in charge of that, but he was running late, and so he had Tom Tillis take over, and he actually ran the entire thing. It was about two and a half hours long, something like that. And uh, had some interesting points that were made, and I want to share some of those with you. So I am going to go through this and just play a few little clips to give you a feel for some of the things that were being said. So let me start out with Lindsey Graham, because he explains what the legislation is that Tom Tillis has proposed and that legislation isn't really too official yet because I couldn't really find documentation for it. But it is a bill that he wants to see passed. So that's what they're going to be talking about. And it's kind of the basis of this entire hearing. So anyway, let me play this clip from Lindsey Graham and you can get an overview of what this is all about. I agree that what Senator Tillis is trying to accomplish is to put sanctuary cities, communities, counties, whatever entity we're talking about on notice that in the future, if you knowingly let a violent criminal go, you refuse to work with federal authorities to detain this violent criminal, you could be sued if they hurt somebody. So I, you know, I kind of have to agree with him that if you are harmed by the policies of a sanctuary city, you should be able to sue that jurisdiction for you know the harm that they have done to you by allowing those illegal aliens who have criminal histories to be released i understand what they're saying and you know i believe that it probably is a good bill it's just not going to get democrat support i'm pretty sure on that one so let me go on the next person to speak was chuck grassley and I'm not necessarily getting everybody because like Diane Feinstein was in there too and, you know, others, but I'm picking out some of the best ones. And Chuck Grassley started out with a really good question. So let me play that for you. Very much. Before I ask my questions, uh, I want to ask unanimous consent, including a statement provided by my constituent, Michelle Root, for the record. Michelle's daughter, Sarah, was killed by an illegal immigrant in 2016, less than 24 hours after she graduated from college. Uh, her story is an example of why Congress must take action to end dangerous sanctuary cities policies uh, around the country. Without objection, be entered to the record. Yeah. Uh, panel, I can't believe we're here again talking about sanctuary cities and the inconceivable practice of ignoring lawful uh, issued warrants of arrest and detainers. Uh, we should have done something about that a long time ago. Uh, so I, I'll immediately get to my questions. I got some other examples of uh, New York City recently as one example uh, of where uh, an illegal person uh, had been, uh, uh, should have been removed and had been sexually abusing children as an example. So my question to you, uh, Mr. Robbins, what trends are you seeing in criminal reoffending because ICE isn't allowed to take custody of aliens with immigration arrests? And maybe you can give me a short summary to that question because I have a more, uh, more important question to ask you beyond that. Senator, when aliens walk out the front of the jail that could have been handed over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement for removal proceedings, they have the opportunity to commit additional crimes. What we've seen, and depending on the report that you look at, anywhere from 40 to 80 percent of those that have committed crimes will reoffend. So, in that regard, what we're seeing is crimes that could be preventable, the human cost, people are being victimized and hurt by criminal aliens that ICE had the ability to remove from this country. Okay. So, yeah, that's an awful lot of reoffenders, wouldn't you say? Well, you know, I have a hard time understanding the Democrat position on this because it really seems to me that they are standing in the way of criminals being arrested. How can you do that? 
But I guess they really need that illegal vote to get them over the top or something. But let's go on, because then we had uh, the Representative Lee from Utah, who made some really good points. So here we go on that. If you think traffic laws are necessary, you necessarily also see the need for traffic cops. If you think health and sanitation codes are important to have and enforce, you see the need for health inspectors. And if you think a country has the right to decide who comes into the country, how long they stay and under what circumstances they come in, then you necessarily have to see the need for immigration enforcement officers. It's common sense. And yet, despite that common sense understanding, we've seen a growing number of lawmakers and activists and figures within our news media and the political commentariat calling openly for the abolition of ICE. They've compared ICE and other enforcement officers to Gestapo or to fugitive slave catchers uh, as if there were somehow a moral equivalence between a country enforcing its laws governing who comes in and uh, the circumstances under which they come in and these reprehensible uh, examples from history that are so troubling. It's difficult to draw any conclusion from these out-of-touch arguments uh, other than that those who embrace them reject the very notion that America should control its borders. The most concrete expression of this de facto open borders, borders policy this uh, uh, national boundary nihilism, uh, you, you might say, has perhaps been the proliferation of so-called sanctuary jurisdictions across the United States. Now look, I'll be the first to defend the authority of a state or a local government to decide how best to allocate its law enforcement resources. That is, in fact, a state and local government prerogative. That doesn't mean that this is good policy doesn't mean it's a good idea. It doesn't mean it's anything other than a horrible idea to decide not to provide any assistance to those charged with the important task of enforcing immigration laws. Uh, I, I think this is a, a very dangerous idea. As Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida noted uh, recently when he signed Florida's ban on sanctuary cities, quote, sanctuary cities drive down the wages of workers, erode the rule of law, and are unfair to our legal immigrants and incentivize illegal immigration, close quote. He said it well. These are not victimless crimes. These are not things that can go unenforced without harming good people. Before I move on to some questions, let me just stop here to thank the men and women who serve within ICE and CBP and thank them for their willingness to put their lives on the line their willingness to endure the indignity of these personal insults. And thank you on behalf of me and my family and all peace-loving Americans everywhere for the fact that you strive every day to serve and protect your fellow Americans and to serve and protect those with whom you interact and uh, uh, those involved in circumstances where you enforce the law with dignity and respect. So, you know, he had some really good things to say there. And before he gets into questioning this guy, I wanted to show you who he is. He's Timothy Robbins, Acting Executive Associate Director, Reinforcement Removal Operations, United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Wow. <laughs> you know, when you talk about some of these people, they do really have these big, long titles. But this guy, he is specifically his task is enforcement of removal operations. So removal operations is key. Now, he was brought in by the Republicans. In fact, both of the guys on this panel were. But in the next panel, there's an angel mom and a man who was brought in by the Democrats. So wanted to just make sure you understood that's who he is. And the other guy is... Uh, United States Attorney for the Western District of North Carolina, and he's uh, Andrew Murray on that. And you can download their testimonies if you want to. Here's the second panel that we'll just see a clip from hers. We're not going to watch much of his because it, he was really kind of all over the place. 
Obviously, he was there for the Democrats, so he tended to be more towards them. But he also had to agree that there needed to be some safety measures and things. So I thought that was kind of interesting. He's a former chief of police out of Palestine, Texas. So I don't even know where Palestine, Texas is. But anyway, so let me play this next clip because this Timothy Robbins mentions collateral arrests. And I want you to pay close attention to what he says about that, because I think it's a key factor in why these law enforcement agencies need to be able to work together with each other. So listen to this. In 2009, there were approximately 40 sanctuary jurisdictions in this country. Just a few years later in 2016, that number had ballooned up to 338. And by May of last year, that number had reached 564. Uh, it, Mr. Robbins, in your, in your prepared testimony, you noted that 70% of all ICE arrests are attributable to the criminal aliens program, um, which, which relies heavily on the cooperation of state and local governments. Is that right? That's correct. As a matter of fact, that percentage used to be higher. And so if this trend continues, if we continue to see the growth of this trend toward the development of sanctuary jurisdictions rising as it has been, uh, what will that say about our ability to continue to enforce the law? Well, what that does, there's a direct impact. There's a human cost for criminals actually going into the communities, victimizing and hurting people. But there's a true cost for ICE enforcement. ICE enforcement will no longer be in the jails. They'll be in the communities, the same communities that these sanctuary policies are trying to keep ICE out of. The reality is, is sanctuary policies are not going to keep ICE out of the community. What they'll do is, and I will have to send officers out onto the streets, which is less safe for the officers the subject that we're arresting in the community at large. And it's the same place that when we talk about collateral arrest, our officers cannot walk away from somebody in violation of law. And the reality is, is in that situation, in a jail, collateral arrests just don't happen. They do in the community. So yeah, collateral arrests. And did you catch what he said? What actually happens when these sanctuary cities take up that stance is they make it more dangerous for both the ICE officers, but also for the immigrant community. Because you see, the difference is you've got this ICE officer walking into a jail or a courthouse or something like that to take custody of the illegal immigrant who has committed a crime. That's pretty safe for the ICE officers. It doesn't involve the community at all. They're perfectly kept safe because that person's been put behind bars. So it's keeping that person away from them. And so it's a lot safer. But if the ICE agents have to actually go into the community, there's much more possibility that some bystander is going to get hurt. It could be a totally innocent person. It could be like a child. It could be even a legal immigrant that might live in that area. So it really does cause a lot of problems when they have the sanctuary cities because they're refusing to support federal law. And because of that, they are actually putting these immigrants that they claim to really care about in harm's way. So, you know, it's really not a good situation. If they would cooperate with ICE, it would be so much easier and be safer for everybody. But Anyway, let's go on because the next question was also very good and has to do with the inflammatory rhetoric against the ICE agents. As I noted, this, this uh, trend toward uh, inflammatory rhetoric directed at ICE officials is troubling. Um, even worse, the rhetoric sometimes develops into something more kinetic, more violent as we saw earlier this year when a man threw incendiary devices at an ICE facility in Washington state. Uh, in other circumstances, people uh, gang up on, on those providing services for ICE, contractors uh, who provide essential services for ICE to be able to do what it needs to do. And if, if I've been correctly informed, in some cases, some of these contractors have confronted banking bans uh, encouraged by activists who say we shouldn't have ICE, so you shouldn't be profiting off of ICE, 
So you shouldn't do business with them. And if you do, you will be unable to bank with us or any of these other companies that have decided to do it. Can you speak for just a moment on what kind of an impact these kinds of actions, uh, the physical violence, the incendiary inflammatory comments, um, and, and the other acts of retaliation against ICE, how have they impacted morale uh, within ICE? So when it comes to ICE, I've never worked with a better group of what public servants, many of them are veterans uh, that come out of our armed services that are currently enforcing a very difficult law with the tools that Congress gave them. Congress gave us the rules and the laws in which we're to enforce then gave us the tools to do it. We're being attacked not only professionally when it comes to, you know, detainers we're being litigated against, but in the communities we're, we're having protests in front of our officers' homes. We have uh, shots were fired inside uh, one of our uh, offices in San Antonio. Incendiary device was thrown over the fence in one of our detention centers, which put not only our officers at, at harm's risk, but the detainees that were in there as well. We, we need Congress's help when it comes to immigration enforcement. Not only do the people, the men and women of ICE, uh, need your help in regards to uh, their moral well-being, but we need it in, in regards to doing our jobs. And doing our jobs is what we do to keep the public safe. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't know all that stuff was going on. I knew some of those things were happening to the ICE agents, but... Wow, you know, they're going through so much. And this is what I really don't understand because the left seems to like to blame us and to accuse us of being dangerous and that we are the ones to instigate violence. And it's like, no, that's not what reality is saying. Reality says otherwise. And there are plenty of video clips now coming out that's proving that. Like, you know, when they go to a Trump rally, the people standing in line waiting to get in are not the ones causing problems. So this is another instance where the left doesn't like what ICE does. So they attack. They do violent things. I wanted you to hear that one, too. Like I said, he did a really good job with his questioning. Now, I'm going to play a little bit of Maisie Hirono. I know, I know. I'll make it short enough. But I do want you to understand what the other side was basically saying. And she was kind of the poster child for that side of the entire argument. But her basic theme has to do with the whole term violent offenders. And that was her talking point that she wanted to drive home and to try to make it sound like they could only go after violent offenders. And that's what they were claiming they were doing but it wasn't reality. So listen to what she has to say. I know, I'll make it short. Mr. Robbins, you testified that ICE issues detainers based on probable cause that the individual in custody is removable. Do you have to show that the individual is a violent offender in order to determine probable cause? We have to come, uh, two things. One, we have to know who that individual is. So through biometrics, we're able to do that, fingerprints. And then two, we have to reach probable cause either through uh, database checks, interviews, or the fact that that individual was removed previously or it's, it uh, is in currently uh, Mr. Robbins, proceedings. my question was whether or not you have to show that the individual is a violent offender because uh, the line of questioning that, that you have been, uh, been asked have to do with violent offenses. So I want to know whether probable so, cause so you have to our show. Our probable cause is removability of the individual from yes. the country, not the so, fact that they're a violent offender. Thank you. Yes, so... Evidently, the only thing that counts is a violent offense, because if they, you know, rob somebody without a gun or something, that's not a violent offense. I mean, how is she determining what is or isn't a violent offense? And see, that's where it would come into things. Now, if they commit identity fraud, that's not a violent offense, but they should be deported because of that, or they should at least be jailed, don't you think? So, yeah, she really focused on that. That was what she was hammering the entire time. And then she went into, I'm going to save you the rest of it, okay? I'll just summarize. She went into where domestic violence victims would go to a courthouse to try to get a restraining order against the abuser, and I could get them then. Well, that's what they were trying to say, that no, it, even if that were the case and they would pick up that person 
for some reason, then there are ways to get around that. And yeah, they do have a case by case thing that if that were the situation, they'd work with that. But first of all, you got to wonder, because ICE has to have the warrant to go after this person to do this. This is what they're just wanting to do. Well, why would they have a warrant against a victim of domestic violence unless that person is guilty of something else? And if they are guilty of something else, then maybe they should be arrested. That was her focus. And then, of course, she went into that big ice raid that they had on that factory in, uh, what was it, Mississippi, I think it was? I forget. But yeah, they had that where they had like seven, eight hundred people that they took. And then the media had all the little kids on there crying and say, look at all these little kids they had left. Well, he specifically said that most of the people that were released on that right away were single parents. So that meant that there was nobody to take care of the children. So they let him go. And she looked at him like that wasn't at all what she was asking. I don't know. I think she was surprised at that and didn't want to admit it. But anyway, so yeah, that was the negative side. And of course, Dick Durbin had some really choice words, but he had to bring it back to Trump. So here you go on the Dick Durbin one. Currently spent in the jail. And I can tell you the statistics in Illinois when it turns out that fewer than 20% of those actually deported have been charged with any serious crime. Senator, I, I, I agree with you that it's time for immigration reform, and I think we can all agree for that. And you, the but, patchwork approach but, that we're now talking about, let's sue one person, let's sue another person, is not going to solve the problem. Correct. But here today, when it comes to sanctuary cities allowing us to get in the jails to actually arrest those that have committed crimes in our neighborhoods, that should be our top priority. It really should be. And the reason it's not is because of what Superintendent Johnson said. And the, the president of the large cities, 69 of them, have come out against your proposal that you just stated. And the reason is they've got to live in these communities. When the president scares the hell out of these people who are undocumented and but, all of their families, they've still got to police these communities. I, I, I understand, and we have to live in the communities too. And I'm telling you, I would, I do not want one more sex offender released into our communities to prey on our children. I certainly don't either. But that grandmother was not a sex offender. I can't speak to that particular case, well, but I understand you your point. It was well publicized, and that's the point. You want to go after drug dealers, serious criminals, and sex offenders? Count me in. But going after that grandmother and more like her to prove your point about how tough we are. Come on. Well, I don't think that was a, a point about how tough we are. I think our officers have an obligation that when someone is, and I can't speak to this particular case, but when they come across somebody that's in violation of law. Which means they, they came across the border illegally, but, but, right? Correct. But there's that's discretion it. throughout the process, whether it's placed someone in proceedings, whether they're placed in a non-detained setting, whether they're detained, and ultimately whether they're removed. When we there are avenues of relief credible, throughout the process. When we get back to a credible exchange for the safety of the United States, count me in. At this point, this president's declared war on immigrants, and the fear in the community that I represent is the reason we're sitting here today. Yeah, Durbin was none too nice. And he told a story of a woman who was stopped for some traffic thing, and she was covered under DACA, and she and her daughter, the officer accompanied her to her home and then arrested her mother, who had been there in the country for 20 years and who was illegal. And then he got all bent out of shape because of that. And it's like, well, but if they observe someone who has broken the law, then they have to act on that. That's what the Robbins guy said. And I think probably, you know, he didn't give all the details in that situation, but it's very likely that the grandmother was supposed to appear in court and she never showed up for the court date. You know, they come across illegal, they get this court date and then they're released and they never show up. So that very well could have been. And so probably she was arrested because she didn't show up for the hearing. 20 years ago or whatever the case is so anyway he was none too happy but of course he had to pin it on trump it's all trump's fault orange man bad mm. and so then after that there was a guy named holly and i'll tell you what holly first of all he's an excellent speaker and he really did a good job getting kind of down to the nitty-gritty so let me play a little clip from him he uh wanted to point out what I 
said earlier that, you know, when they arrest them out in the community, that's putting everybody at risk. So let me play that for you. Safe. I can tell you that the people of Missouri are grateful for your work, and I'm sorry for the tremendous abuse that you and your agents, law enforcement agents, have to take and the, um, the, the things that have been said about you and, of course, the attempts to eliminate uh, your agency, I think, are just unbelievable uh, in this, uh, the, considering the threats that so many communities face. Let me ask you about some of those. I want to talk to you about removal operations and about one statistic in particular because I think it counters the widespread misperception of what ICE does that has been cultivated uh, by uh, many on the other side. According to your agency's own data, in fiscal year 2019, 90% of individuals arrested by ICE fell into at least one of the following categories. Here they are, individuals with a criminal conviction, individuals with a pending criminal charge, individuals who illegally reentered the country after being previously deported, which is itself a felony, or individuals who are fugitives from their immigration proceedings and have final orders of removal issued against them. Does that statistic That's sound correct. right to you? Is that correct? That's correct. So if I understand it then, I, the idea that ICE is prioritizing and arresting families whose only crime is illegal entry, simply it, it's not correct according to these statistics. Is that fair to it say? It's not correct unless they had a final order of removal. So turning to the kinds of people that ICE is actually prioritizing, let, let's talk about those first who have passed criminal convictions and those with pending criminal charges. Can you give us some sense of the categories of crimes that aliens have been convicted of or charged with when ICE uh, picks them up from a local jail or prison? Like, for instance, has ICE arrested uh, murderers who are subject to removal? They have. What about sexual predators? Absolutely. What about drug traffickers? Yes. Let me ask you also briefly about aliens who've committed illegal reentry, uh, meaning, of course, that they've been deported before, but uh, because of the border have, have come, our insecure border, have come back to the country. How frequently... Is ICE finding and arresting illegal aliens who have committed crimes and who have illegally reentered the country two or three or more times? Uh, I don't have the specific stats, but it is a frequent occurrence. Do these cases sometimes involve dangerous individuals? Absolutely do. I, again, I just want to say that uh, we're very grateful to you in the state of Missouri for the work that you do. In Missouri, we don't have any sanctuary uh, jurisdictions. And uh, I can tell you from talking to our state and local law enforcement that what, what Missourians want, what Missouri law enforcement often say is that they need more ICE officers. They want greater and deeper cooperation because, frankly, uh, they need the backup. And when we are overwhelmed by drug trafficking in the state of Missouri, we're overwhelmed by those drugs that Senator Durbin was talking about pouring across the southern border coming into our state uh, and uh, by uh, uh, the crime and violence that often comes with them. So let me just ask you this. Can you tell me, in your experience, what's the impact? impact on public safety when a jurisdiction um, becomes a sanctuary jurisdiction? What's that mean for the public safety of that place? So the public safety, it's not only, it's not only just public safety, but it's an officer, officer safety concern. So when we have to then send our ICE officers into the community in which the sanctuary policies are trying to protect, it puts everybody at risk. Um, it puts the subject we're arresting, the people within the community. And there's a human cost to this that we're not talking about. So not only is it, is it difficult with our limited resources, but these people that are being released from jails are recommitting crimes. They're victimizing people. They're hurting people. And the reality is, is if you look at the recidivism rate for criminals, those that have committed crimes, anywhere from 40 to 80%, of those that are released from jails are going to commit an additional crime. And usually those crimes will escalate in violence. So, yeah, I mean, it puts everybody at risk. So it's something that should not be continued. And, you know, I don't understand the whole concept behind these sanctuary cities because they are states and they have a responsibility to support and uphold federal agencies. That would be kind of like them having the FBI come in to investigate a crime that the FBI is supposed to be investigating in their state. And they go, no, nope, we're not going to let you in. We're not going to let you investigate that. You can't do that. <laughs> you know, states do have rights to do their own thing in a lot of areas, but they don't have the right to just thumb their nose at federal law. And that's essentially what's happening with this. Somebody somewhere, I think it was one of the Democrats, said, we need to figure out the balance of how much the local law enforcement has to work with the federal government. And it's like, 
Really? You have to figure it out? It's not a balance thing. It's a federal law. It's a federal agency. You cooperate with them. That's what you do. And so I don't know that it's necessarily the law enforcement people that are, you know, questioning this. But I, I just, when they said that, it was like, well, obviously you cooperate. There's no balance. There's no, oh, we'll give you this much cooperation instead of all the cooperation. No, you cooperate fully. Why would you not? Then we got Ted Cruz. And you're just going to have to listen to what Ted Cruz has to say. Now that you've got the picture of what else was being said by the Democrats, now we're going to hear something that kind of smacks them all down. <laughs> so here we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Robbins, let me start by saying thank you to all the men and women of ICE, uh, to the law enforcement officers who risk their lives each and every day. I want to apologize to the men and women of ICE for the vilification, for the demonization that happens every day in our political discourse and that sadly happens from far too many politicians in this town who abuse law enforcement officers who are keeping us safe. I have been blessed to get to know and to work with ICE officers, Border Patrol officers, and these are agents who are risking their lives every day. Our communities are safer because of them. I have to say, when I'm at home at Tex in Texas, Texans are angry about this discussion, about this political farce that we're seeing. Some of our Democratic colleagues have asked you questions. Well, isn't it true that some of the illegal aliens that sanctuary cities are releasing are nonviolent? You answered with the rather obvious answer of, yes, some of them are nonviolent. Let me ask you the other side of it. Are sanctuary cities releasing violent murderers? Yes. Are sanctuary cities releasing rapists? Yes. Are sanctuary cities releasing people who have committed child molestation? Yes. Are sanctuary cities releasing people who are guilty of domestic violence? Yes. Are they releasing people who have committed drunk driving offenses? Yes. When I listen to Democratic colleagues saying, well, no, 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 this is all about some grandmother in Chicago. No, this is not about a grandmother in Chicago. I've, I've talked to too many Texans and too many people across this country who've lost their children in murders from illegal aliens who were in jail until Democratic politicians released them, violent criminals, into our community. And it is wrong to play these political games releasing murderers. This committee heard testimony from Kate Steinle's family. Kate Steinle's family was a, Kate Steinle was a beautiful 28-year-old California woman who was murdered on a pier in Northern California by an illegal alien who had been in and out of prison over and over and over again. And yet, and had been deported over and over and over again, and our revolving door system kept letting him go. Kate Steinle's father, who I visited with, held his daughter in his arms as she cried out, Daddy, please save me. Every one of us who has kids, what a, what a nightmare. And the thing that is frustrating, that was utterly and completely preventable. Politics killed her. Political posturing killed her. And by the way, for every Democratic senator who says, well, no, no, we're all for stopping violent criminals. Well, you know what? There's an easy solution. Kate's Law, which I'm the author of in this body. Kate's Law says violent criminal illegal aliens, aggravated felons. If they enter illegally a second time, we'll face a mandatory minimum prison sentence. If you get outside of the fantasy land that is Washington, D.C., an overwhelming supermajority of Americans support Kate's Law. That's true of Republicans, of Democrats, of Libertarians, of Independents. Kate's Law is common sense legislation. I'll tell you what, the Senate has voted on Kate's Law. Every Democratic member of the current Senate that was here voted against Kate's Law, against targeting not the grandmothers. We're not talking about the grandmothers. We're talking our sanctuary cities releasing gang members. Yes. MS-13 members. Yes. And yet, because of politics, Senate Democrats will not stand together to stop it. You want to do something meaningful? Let's pass Kate's Law 100 to nothing. I have town halls where Texans Ask, what on earth is wrong with you people when you have an MS-13 member who's a murderer and yet a local Democratic law enforcement official says, let's release them instead of deporting them or even better, incarcerating them as Kate's law would provide? 
That is wrong. And let me thank Senator Tillis for introducing his legislation. I'm a co-sponsor of Senator Tillis's legislation to say, look, if you're an American and your family is injured by an illegal alien that has been wrongfully released by a sanctuary jurisdiction, you ought to be able to sue that jurisdiction. And don't come to me with a bunch of legal gobbledygook about how we're immune from suit while we're releasing murderers that are terrorizing our communities. That's something else we ought to do is take up and pass Senator Tellis' legislation. So I want to say to the witnesses here, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your hard work to keep us safe. Thank you for the officer tonight who's out on the line, who's knocking on that door of an MS-13 agent who doesn't know if he's going to meet a machine gun on the other side of that door, a machete, doesn't know what he's going to face, but he's, he or she is going through that door to keep us safe. Thank you for that. And I hope, I get we have political differences. Fine, let's have, let's have debates about what the top marginal tax rate should be. That's a great debate. But it shouldn't be a debate whether we're releasing murderers in our communities. The answer for all of us, Democrat and Republican, ought to be hell no. We're not going to release violent murderers who are illegal aliens into our communities. And yet we've got sanctuary jurisdictions all across the country who are willing to do so. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) So way to go, Cruz. And I love the way he put it out there so that they had... You know, all the Democrats had been saying, well, but it's all about these grandmothers. And no, because he labeled everything that they're stopping. So he did a great job on this, put it all together, put it in perspective. And yeah, he's right about Kate's law. There's absolutely no reason that shouldn't have been passed. And the Democrats are standing in the way. So you got to wonder. Well, you don't really wonder at this point. We know that they don't have the American people's best at heart, that they're not about the people. They're not public servants. They are people who believe they're the overlords and that they can do whatever they want. And it doesn't really matter if the people are getting what they promised them or not, which is sad. Very, very sad. Okay, I'm going to close with this final video has to do with the angel mom that was there to testify in the second session. Chairman, I'm testifying today on behalf of all angel families who have been affected by illegal alien crime. But today specifically, I'm addressing the pain, suffering, and loss brought to American families after sanctuary policies prohibited ICE detainers to be honored, resulting in illegal alien criminals being released into our communities and committing criminal acts. Until one of you who support sanctuary policies or any elected official shoving these sanctuary policies on us are directly affected by illegal alien crime, you will never understand the depth of pain, grief, and hopelessness that they create. These policies are not put on a ballot for voter approval. They are put in place without voter approval. And many people have been convinced by politicians and special interest groups that sanctuary policies keep our communities safer. Nothing could be further from the truth. Just ask our law enforcement officers. And I've talked to men and women on the front lines from Virginia to Arizona, Texas to Montana, and they know the danger of releasing criminal illegal aliens into our communities and neighborhoods. Americans are being victimized and left behind by the very officials they voted into office and who made an oath to protect and uphold the law. This includes immigration law. Every day Americans are being marginalized as collateral damage by this incredibly dangerous mindset that criminal illegal aliens deserve above the law protections while they remain illegally present in our country. My son, Brandon Mendoza, was a sergeant with the Mesa, Arizona Police Department And on May 12, 2014, he was on his way home from work when a repeat criminal illegal alien, more than three times illegal limit drunk, high on meth, drove over 35 miles the wrong way on four different freeways in Phoenix and slammed head on going over 100 miles an hour. This illegal criminal had committed crimes in Colorado years before, never showed up for court. He was caught crossing the border from Mexico taken back to Sanctuary Colorado to face his charges, was given a slap on the wrist and released by the judge. And he ultimately ended up in Arizona killing my son. 
In November of 2018, Aaron Hampton was shot more than 25 times by a repeat offender, criminal illegal alien in Springfield, Missouri. ICE had a detainer on Luis Perez and had requested Middlesex County, New Jersey to hold him for deport deportation proceedings following his arrest for felony crimes that included assault, aggravated assault, and child abuse. He had the, had the ICE detainer been honored, as every detainer should be, Aaron Hampton would be alive today. Make no mistake, Luis Perez is a repeat offender, criminal illegal alien from Mexico who has no legal right to live in our country. He committed crimes that was not only shown leniency, but shielded from repercussions for his actions by the government of New Jersey. I ask of this committee, would I be shown the same leniency had I broken federal law? Would any state in this union protect me or any other American from being detained, arrested, and prosecuted by the federal government? We all know the answer, a resounding no. In July of 2019, Jonathan West Jr. was on his way home from work on his motorcycle in Richmond, California, when Jocelyn Escobar, an illegal alien, turned in front of him. He landed on her windshield and was thrown 10 feet into a pole. Jonathan died nine days later. Today, his killer is walking free in California because of sanctuary policies, while Jonathan's mother, Giselle, lives her biggest nightmare every day. November 2018, Sander Cohen, a fire marshal, and Carlos Wolf, an FBI agent, were killed on the side of the road in sanctuary Montgomery County. That illegal alien was fined $240. That's what an FBI agent's life and a fire marshal's life is worth in Montgomery County. An unlicensed and uninsured criminal who entered our nation illegally is currently being protected from her responsibilities in California under federal law due to these reckless sanctuary policies passed by politicians who serve and protect themselves. American citizens have to pay for their crimes, but repeat offender, criminal, illegal aliens are being protected by the governments who exist to serve and protect American citizens and legal residents. No matter your political affiliation, ideology, or party loyalty, imagine your child dead, gone, separated permanently due to the criminal, reckless, and sometimes evil actions of someone who never had a right to be here in the first place, someone whose crimes could have been prevented had federal laws not been skirted by dangerous sanctuary policies we're seeing across this country. And quite frankly, I'm appalled to be sitting in the U.S. Senate building and actually listening to American elected senators arguing in favor of criminal illegal aliens and forgetting innocent American victims, never fighting for our rights, for our pain and suffering. I'm disappointed and saddened to, to see what you've become. And today, I ask all the members of this committee, think about your loved ones, think about Americans, think about our loss, and think about our, the fairness under the rule of law. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. I mean, get out the Kleenex, because she really told it like it is. And, you know, I really am amazed at how the Democrats can listen to the stories of the angel moms and dads and just not understand or let it not even touch their hearts because these people have lost their children and they talk about child separation, you know, and Maisie Hirono had that at the end. She was talking about, oh, all the children separated, you know, but these people are American citizens and they are forever separated from their children because someone was in our country illegally and committed an illegal act. And in a lot of cases, the person was already deported and should never have been back in our country again. When I hear stories like that, that's when I want to support the bill that Tillis is putting out there because they need to have some kind of recourse. Parents who have lost their children like that, they need to have something that they can do to stop these sanctuary cities and to hold them accountable for what's happening. Now, I did want to point out one last thing, and it's this tweet by Senator Tom Tillis. 
And he was talking about today, I led the Senate Judiciary hearing on sanctuary cities and their impact on public safety and victims of crimes committed by illegal immigrants. I believe these victims are entitled to a private right of civil action against any political unit whose actions caused them harm. Well, and then he has the link to the video. But you know what really saddens me is not a one of these people supported that. Or supported him. They were awful. Every single one. There's not one tweet here that supports what he's saying. It's all about their hatred for Trump. It's Trump derangement syndrome. Every single one. That's ridiculous. I don't know the guy, but I can't imagine that there's not a few of his constituents saying, yeah, we agree. Good thing. You know, you need to stand up for this. But nope, no body. So anyway, keep him in your prayers. But I'll put all the links down below. Well, it's really just this link and this link. So I'll put those down below and you can watch it if you want to and see the full hearing. But there wasn't a whole lot more to it than that. Anyway, that's what I've got for you on this one. I want to thank you for stopping by and I'll see you all later. Later.